Welcome to the Ask Your Mentor podcast from Dementia Researcher and Alzheimer's Research UK, where mentees interview their mentors to hear about their careers, experiences, and to find out what makes them tick. Hello, and welcome to the Ask Your Mentor podcast. I am Dr. Melissa Salazar. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the UK DRI Research Institute at University College London. And my study uh, is focused on the contribution of individual cells to risk and progression of Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and but for this, I'm using a series of new methods called single cell multiomics. If, if you're new to the series, let me recap a bit about what these podcasts are about. Uh, mentees are meant to interview their mentors to explore their career journey, uncover their research interests, and to learn about the challenges they have faced along the way. We also try and extract some tips that will help in our own careers, so get ready to make some notes about it. Let me introduce my own brilliant mentor, the wonderful Dr. Stephen Quinn, Senior Lecturer and Alzheimer's Research UK Fellow at the University of York. Hi, Hi Melissa. Great to be here. Steve and I were matched through the Alzheimer's Research UK Mentoring Program, a fantastic free scheme helping researchers connect with people who can help, support knowledge transfer, professional development, personal growth, and hopefully help improve attention at a time when we need people the most. We start each of these shows by asking our mentors to take us through their CVs, and this is a brilliant way to demonstrate that there is no such thing as a standard academic career path. But whatever your path is, there is a road to success. So Steve, can you tell us how you ended up in York? Yeah, so I guess my career began at the University of, of St Andrews um, as an undergraduate physics student. Um, so initially, when I started off, I was really interested in, in astrophysics. Um, I, was, I was desperate to learn more about, I guess, space and the, the universe. Um, but I quickly realized that astrophysics was basically the study of dust, and I found it quite quite kind of dull and and very theoretical. Um, and so probably halfway through my undergraduate degree, um, I took a course called biophotonics. And at that point, I became interested in how we could use light, um, you know, something that we can't touch or feel, but we could use light to manipulate and study biological systems. And, and so that was that was quite interesting to me. Um, so after my, my undergraduate um, degree in St Andrews, I moved to Oxford to do a Master of Science by research. So again, using light to detect and understand biological um, systems. And we ended up um, developing uh, a, a tool that not only could detect uh, cancerous tissue, but which may, um, in the not too distant future, be useful for um, surgical applications. So after the, the Master of Research, um, an opportunity opened, a PhD opportunity uh, opened up um, actually at the, the University of St. Andrews again to develop um, what we call a, a single molecule spectroscopy system. So it was basically a, a microscope that allows us to, to measure and detect and understand um, single molecules. And this is back really at a time where single molecule spectroscopy was still in its infancy and only a handful of research groups um, were either working in the area, building the, the techniques, and certainly it, it wasn't a mainstream um, technology. So throughout my PhD, I, I became involved in uh, the detection of uh, protein uh, oligomers that are implicated in Alzheimer's disease using the single molecule spectroscopy um, technologies. But as part of my PhD, I also developed um, a series of fluorescence based assays for monitoring protein aggregation that didn't involve um, the use of extrinsic dyes, which we know um, can often perturb the protein aggregation systems. So essentially, we were trying to create new tools to allow us to study protein aggregation um, by bypassing some of the major limitations of, of conventional um, approaches. Um, so from what I've just said, it, it sounds uh, like I was a bit of an optical physicist, and I think that's, that's really true of my early career. Um, I was an optical physicist without really much expertise in the biology or the biochemistry side of things. 
Um, so after my uh, my PhD, uh, I moved to the University of Glasgow, and again, still remained within the single molecule biophysics um, community, but I, I became more interested in protein DNA interactions. Um, I became interested in uh, using uh, the, the single molecule technologies to understand quantum dots and photophysics. So it was really um, three years spent trying to diversify my research skills, but whilst also staying within the single molecule spectroscopy um, community. Um, after my, my postdoc in, in Glasgow, I then applied for a Lindman Trust um, Fellowship and was successful. And that, that enabled me to go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and work with um, a, a really great research group that's driving forward single molecule spectroscopy applications, but also um, the development of novel model membrane systems. Um, and so my fellowship there at, at MIT really involved um, getting my hands dirty with the biochemistry, designing and constructing new model membrane systems that allowed us to then study proteins embedded within those systems using single molecule approaches. So MIT, it was really my first experience of using uh, biochemistry and biochemical techniques to create a sample that I could then study using the expertise um, that I, you know, I, I built up over the course of my PhD and, and previous um, postdoc. Um, at the end of the, the, the fellowship, um, I then applied for a lectureship position in biophysics at the, the University of York and then moved to York in, uh, in 2017. Um, in 2019, I became an Alzheimer's Research UK Fellow. And really my fellowship, um, if you like, drew upon all of my expertise from my previous fellowship and previous postdoctoral positions. And I tried to, um, and I, I still try to, um, leverage single molecule spectroscopy techniques to study how proteins um, interact with biological membranes. So really my fellowship is all about using uh, many of the single molecule spectroscopy methods um, developing new model membrane systems and understanding how the proteins that are implicated in Alzheimer's disease and dementia um, perturb those, those membrane systems. And, and to date, we've got some really interesting um, and really surprising results that are, are currently um, in uh, the, the draft stage of the, the publication um, process. And we hope to share many of those results um, with the scientific community um, very, very soon. But over the last, I guess, uh, couple of years, um, so in, in the last year, I was promoted to senior lecturer. Um, and over the last year, I realized that actually a lot of the technologies that we use um, and a lot of the methods that we use. So, for example, our ability not only to detect proteins using light, but our ability to immobilize proteins onto surfaces. Um, could actually be important in the context of detecting uh, proteins within human biofluid, for example, blood um, samples. And so now I think my research focus is now shifting away from using single molecule biophysics to detect and understand protein aggregation and protein membrane interactions, but towards using our technologies for early stage biomarker detection. I mean, we, we've seen recently, um, yesterday, actually, uh, the development of, uh, you know, a new promising treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And I think now the challenge is detecting people in the earliest stages of disease. And so I think that where we're going as a research lab is to use and adapt our technologies for early stage uh, biomarker detection, which we hope might then facilitate um, early stage diagnosis and then ultimately the, the recruitment of patients into um, clinical trials. So we're, we're really excited by where, um, where we're going. Um, I think we're even more excited by preliminary data, which uh, suggests that we can detect at really, really low concentrations of unlabeled amyloid using our sensor technologies. Um, and I think that we've got grounds to be optimistic now in the, the scientific community that a, a simple blood test for Alzheimer's disease and dementia um, might be on the horizon.
So, so that's where we're at currently. Um, you know, there's there's lots of challenges and um, uh, I, I guess barriers that I've had to overcome along the way, um, as other scientists do. So, for example, obtaining funding um, is is extremely difficult, especially in this particular landscape. Um, of course, you know, there, there's scientific reviewer comments that have to be um, responded to and responded to well and in a, in a you know, a, a proper scientific uh, way. Um, but overcoming, you know, all of these challenges and these, um, uh, I guess, barriers are, I think, you know, part of the, the process, part of the scientific process. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like fascinating all the way you have taken us through your career. But it does sound like there was a path of um, finding the right opportunity, taking it. And um, also, I suppose there was a bit of trial and error on the way, you know, trying things that you thought you were really passionate about. And this was going to be the next 50 years of your life and maybe... Uh, you just decided to take a different route that took you to even better stuff. So I wonder now, like, how did you know at, at what stage and also, like, yeah, at what point, what you wanted to do with your life? I guess, I mean, I, I knew, I think, quite early on in my undergraduate degree um, that I wanted to pivot away from, from astrophysics and go down the, um, the biology route. And I think I knew pretty early on that I, I was more interested in understand, understanding disease as opposed to um, understanding fundamental biological mechanisms. Um, and moreover than that, uh, both my, my grandparents, uh, my grandfathers had um, dementia. And so I was particularly interested um, to understand the, the building blocks of dementia. I think largely because I had experienced dementia first firsthand, um, and there's 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 a quote that that sort of always stuck with me, um, and that is that in Alzheimer's disease the mind dies first. Names, dates, and places, the the interior scrapbook of an entire life, fade into the mists of non recognition, um, and so that particular quote, coupled with my experiences, always really stuck with me. Um, and I, I, I guess certainly going through my PhD, I, I became very interested in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and where we're at today, as I say, I, I, I think that we can use many of our technologies, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but I think they're also translatable towards um, Parkinson's, Huntington's, um, and potentially even motor neuron disease. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, I mean... That would be amazing if we can take some knowledge from a disease and try to make it translatable to others. Um, I suppose, uh, I mean, I wanted to ask you, it sounds like you were moving as well uh, from uh, Glasgow to America to York. Uh, so how did you find uh, basically the settlement in, in a workplace? Was it difficult at times? Were there also like maybe cultural differences or... Yeah, I mean, um, I was I was quite lucky in the sense that my my wife is from the Boston area, um, and so I already had um, you know uh, family in the the Boston area when I moved to MIT. So that that I guess um, helped a, a little bit um, bridge the the cultural differences between the UK and the and the USA. So I I already had that I guess support base um, in place. But my experience was um, frankly great. You know, I, I loved um, every second of immersing myself into a new culture. Um, I loved every minute of um, working with scientists from all over the the, the world. Um, I think when I when I first um, moved to to, to MIT, uh, the the research group contains specialists in ultra fast fluorescent spectroscopy, which I, I just wasn't completely familiar with at all. And um, so to learn a little bit, um, not only about their cultures, but also about ultra fast spectroscopy um, was really valuable uh, in my sort of future career. And 
Now in, in New York, we, we have an ultra fast fluorescence spectroscopy apparatus, largely as a consequence, you know, of, of many of those conversations that, that came up. Um, so yeah, I, I really loved working, um, in the, in the States. I think, um, the Lindemann fellowship, uh, really gave me the, the platform to, to not only go to MIT, but to test new research ideas. Um, I think we had a, a pretty wacky idea of developing a model membrane nano disc. So this is a 20 to 30 nanometer sized lipid disc. And in that disc, we wanted to express using cell free systems, uh, a receptor that's related to cancer, um, uh, and as a, as a drug target. So this crazy idea of developing this model membrane disc, um, purifying and producing a receptor, inserting that receptor into the disc, fluorescently tagging it, and then studying its dynamics via single molecule spectroscopy. Um, and within the first two weeks of being at MIT, we had some really nice preliminary data to suggest their approaches, um, albeit wacky as they sounded on paper, um, could actually be fruitful. And so I, I found it to be a really rewarding process in terms of scientific discovery, a really re rewarding process in, in terms of cultural um, experiences. Um, many of my closest friends um, are still from the, the US. Um, that network that I created at MIT, um, I still use and I still speak to, to many of the, the colleagues that, that I worked with. Every time I go back to Boston for family visits, I always drop into to MIT and, and catch up with, uh, with, with colleagues. And, you know, I would actively encourage anyone who's thinking, um, about a career in interdisciplinary science, or even a career where you're switching research focus. As I say, I was a, a physicist that switched focus to, um, I would say biochemistry, um, molecular biology, I would say, go for it because you know, you learn so many new skills, so many new techniques um, that ultimately will be important for you in the longer term, uh, uh, I guess, research goals of your lab once once that starts to uh, to develop. It does sound like uh, like you were in the, at the right place at the right time in a way. So moving to MIT, which is a really prestigious place, and also being able to find early during your stay in there that you have promising results. I think um, um, as well that the, the important bit is when you apply for a fellowship, you, you want to move to the right place with the right research group that have the right tools and techniques in order to drive forward your, your research. And, and so for me, it, it really was a no brainer because there was only one research group that had single molecule spectroscopy expertise and, um, had a track record in the development of many of the model membrane systems that I wanted to, to pursue. So I think finding the right research group at the right Institute is, is really key for, um, many of these fellowship applications. And for me, you know, it, it just worked out. And um, the timing, as I say, was before, before COVID. Um, so in 2016, 2017 is, is when I applied and then, and then moved to, uh, to MIT. Um, but those fellowship opportunities, although, um, many of them dissipated over COVID, they are now, um, emerging again. And, uh, I would encourage you if you're interested to apply, you know, um, get those ideas written down on paper and try to formulate, you know, interesting uh, research questions that you can then pursue at these really great institutes. Yes, of course. And I mean, after this experience of, of uh, after taking your fellowship uh, opportunity in America, how has you work, has, has, how has your work evolved from there over the years? And, and what lessons do you think you have learned? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, so when I first moved to York, um, I was myself and I, I, I guess I didn't really have any PhD students. I certainly didn't have any undergraduate students. And so I had to think about, okay, so I've moved to York. Um, I've been afforded access to equipment, um, through my, my mentor who very kindly afforded me access to many of his, of, of his single molecule technologies. But I had to think strategically about how can I actually do research 
whilst at the same time writing grants and generating grant income. And so initially I made use of undergraduate BSc and final year master's project students to test some ideas that I had related to the development of not model membrane nano discs, but model membrane vesicles. So I wanted to make um, basically membrane balls that were fluorescently labeled and use those membrane balls as a tool to then explore how they would be damaged or perturbed by various disruptive agents, including you know the proteins implicated in Alzheimer's. Um, and so with, uh, I think it was initially three or four undergraduate students, we all got into the lab, all got our lab coats and safety goggles on, and um, they each tried subtly different approaches because I had to try and optimize the, the preparation of these model membrane systems. And so each student took a, a subtly different approach and we ended up um, you know, optimizing the number of dyes that went onto these um, objects, the, their overall size. Um, and by uh, ballpark Christmas, um, so the students started in September and by about Christmas time, we started to not only build these model membrane systems, but started to get really nice um, preliminary data. And that preliminary data then fed into um, some grant applications that I, you know, I, I, I drew on that data to uh, demonstrate proof of principle. Um, and I was awarded, as I say, an Alzheimer's Research UK fellowship um, based on the development of, of, those, of those systems. Um, that fellowship um, was fantastic for me because it gave me um, the time and the resources to, to really interrogate um, protein vesicle interactions. Um, and my school were fantastic because they also supported me with a PhD student. So, so that meant that I could have a PhD student who was performing research that was, was essentially synergized with my own research aims. And um, one of the things that, that we have discovered recently is that many of the proteins which we think um, damages our model membrane vesicles um, can actually fuse those vesicles together. And so that might have implications in the context of vesicle trafficking systems. And so that PhD student gave me the opportunity to, again, try new things, try different avenues of, uh, of research. And as I say, that ultimately has not only been fruitful, but has led to additional preliminary data, which has then supported, you know, new, new grant applications. And where we're at today, um, a lot of that preliminary data has um, allowed uh, me to gain two additional PhD students. Um, we have a third uh, starting uh, this this October, so we've got now a, a small little army of, of students working in the in the lab, all related to understanding the building blocks of dementia. Um, and we've recently secured a grant which will allow us to bring in a postdoc um, in uh, September October to, as I say, drive forward new ideas related to sensing unlabeled amyloids um, using light with the idea of a, you know, a blood test um, in, in mind. Um, so that's, I guess, how it all developed when I, I moved to, to York. I, of course, was guided um, by uh, mentors along the way. I think it's really important to you know, ask for advice um, and to discuss whether or not you know, your strategies um, are, are I, I guess, valid and appropriate. Um, and I think it's important to ask difficult questions like, you know, I've just moved to, to this university. Um, I need some funding in order to drive forward my exciting program of research. Where can I get that funding from? And what you'll find is there's, there's lots of internal pots of money within your university, also external um, grants that you can apply for, but it's just identifying which ones exist and when to apply for them that I think is, is particularly important. Yeah, I mean, it does sound like during this period when you were adjusting to Jorg, um, you put a lot of focus into trying to build a team as well so that you will generate more data and generate more work that uh, will be funded in the future. Uh, I suppose, uh, I'm not sure if this was your main strategy or how are you basically dealing with 
having to write rants, also write papers, also keep collaborators in, in a, it, like, you know, all the, all the tasks that as researchers we're asked to do when trying to establish our own research yeah. line. In a way. I, I think, I mean, everyone, I think will have different tactics um, for dealing with the, the, the various workloads um, that naturally comes as a scientist. Um, what I like to do, and this sounds really weird, is I like to keep every day essentially a to-do list. Um, and so every minute of every day is effectively accounted for. Um, and the reason I do that is, is because I'm A, the world's slowest writer, and I need to, I need to be able to generate papers in a reasonably quick time frame and write grants within a reasonably quick time frame. And so, for example, if I need to write a paper um, and I know that I've only got an hour, let's say on Tuesday morning to focus on that paper before I need to be in the lab or I need to attend a meeting, then I use that hour to write as much as I can. And I don't care about the, the quality of the writing. I just care about getting ideas down onto a piece of paper. I can worry about editing later um, and I can start to build up the paper very, very quickly just by um, adding not random thoughts, but, but thoughts that come to mind within that hour. Um, so as I say, it's, it's a bit of an odd um, tactic in terms of paper writing, but I, I like to just um, you know, spend when I can getting words on the paper and worrying about the editing, uh, et cetera, at a, at a later date. Um, the to-do list has been really helpful. Every day when I come into work, there's a to-do list and, uh, you know, I, I tick, I tick as much as I can off that, that list. And that keeps me, I think on top of the, the workloads, but I think also having a timetable is, is a really, um, good way of, of ensuring that you, you are focused on the right tasks at the right time. So for example, understanding when your grant deadlines are is, is really important um, because that of course can direct your priority towards a particular application as opposed to um, others. You need to be quite mindful of internal deadlines that exist within universities, not just the external um, deadlines. And so having an appreciation for when your university needs to check your application and check the, uh, the, the, the funding is correct for example, is, is I think key. And then of course, you know, being on top of meetings with collaborators, um, and actually doing research, which is the important bit, um, needs to, to also take, uh, take place as well. So, yeah, I think I'm, um, I'm quite, quite strict with my time. Um, but I think for good reason. Yeah. I suppose sometimes you have to be <laughs> when you have trying to fit so many things in and, um, and yeah, I mean, I hope we all have different strategies, I suppose, and it really depends on on our own situation. But um, yeah, I think I think that is definitely a, an advice that I can take on board. Just also try to, it might also help for motivation in a way, just to feel that you have achieved something when your goal is kind of like far away on the horizon. You just will feel that you're making a little progress towards it so yeah that's that's yeah right. yeah i suppose that can help all right so well now we know more about your career um i think um it's time maybe to get to some speedy career and life tips so um in this part of the show we're going to have some quick fire career questions so it's basically so we need some like very short snappy answers so are you ready steve i'm ready let's go so let's do it so what's one thing you wish someone had told you when you were at the career stage that i am currently use rejection to your advantage in other words, if you submit a grant and it gets rejected, if you submit a paper and it gets rejected, use the feedback to help you improve the paper and help you improve the grant. I know. Yeah. Just wipe your chase out and keep going. <laughs> exactly. F feedback is great. All feedback is great, regardless of whether that feedback is, is negative. Um, use the feedback and, and use it to help you build a more scientifically stronger case. I'll do that. So, and then maybe a bit related. So how do you deal with failure or rejection? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, everyone's got great ideas in grant proposals. Um, everyone has, I think, you know, great scientific data that they want to publish, but reviewers might not see it that way. And so your job, I think, when you get negative um, feedback is to really take on board what the reviewers are saying and either adapt your strategy or perform control experiments to further validate your, your conclusions. But certainly don't, um, don't dismiss negative feedback. As I say, use it in a constructive way. Yes, it's a tough one, but it's a good skill to have, actually. So, um, and then another question, what advice do you have for job seekers in dementia research? Well, in, in terms of um, the, the, the practicalities, uh, I mean, have a look at um, research groups that you're, that you're interested perhaps to work with. Often you find job adverts posted on group websites. Um, don't feel afraid to reach out to a prospective um, advisor. Um, so for example, if there's a particular area of research that you want to become involved within, um, reach out to you know that particular group leader and just explain who you are. Obviously send your CV across and that you have a real passion or desire, motivation for you know performing research in that particular area. Because more often than not, if a job currently doesn't exist within that area, there are fellowship opportunities that can be applied for. Um, and at the end of the day, if you if you don't apply for these opportunities, then ultimately you, you don't get them. So networking, I think, is key. Um, network with your colleagues. Use conferences as a great platform to speak to people about the research. Um, you'll often find at conferences there are careers, events, speak to industrialists, engage opinion on you know the, the research group that you're interested to work for. Um, and, and of course, critique the, the research. Yeah. I suppose the next question, again, is a bit related, uh, but um, it's a kind of like a double question. So first, are you an introvert? And if so, do you have any advice for networking for introverts, like probably me? <laughs> I, I think I probably used to be an introvert. Um, and then I was given a great piece of advice. Um, it's just at a conference, I know it can be quite overwhelming and you, you might feel that you might only want to, you know, speak to your, your lab mates or your, your people that you know, but pick a person who might be presenting at a poster, who might have just given a talk and just walk up to them and say, hello, I'm really interested in your research. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Because those people, I guarantee you, will be delighted that someone has come up to them and ask them about the research and they will happily, I'm sure, discuss their research with you. So it's, it's just breaking that initial barrier. Um, you know, if there's a particular area of research that you're interested in, you want to speak to someone, walk up, make yourself walk up to them and just say hello at a, at a conference uh, because you never know what that could lead to. A collaboration, um, receiving samples, you disseminating knowledge to them to help their, their cause. Um, there's so many advantages that can occur from just having a simple conversation with someone. I know, maybe even just saying that you know somebody doing a similar thing in your field, um, that leads to, you know, a conversation in another networking That's um, that's And it's really, really important, <laughs> I think, to um, strive towards interdisciplinarity. In other words, as an optical physicist, I have very limited experience in, for example, protein preparation and protein production. So I need to speak to people who are involved in that area um, and to tap into that, to that knowledge. And so, you know, if, if you're a biologist that wants to build a microscope, then I encourage you to, to reach out to, you know, the, the optical physicists. Um, so it works. It works both ways. Yeah, that's true. Well, the next one is, what do you see as the biggest trends and challenges facing academia today? And how can aspiring academics can prepare themselves for these challenges? I, I think the biggest strength of academia is that it is very rewarding. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's full of scientific discovery. Um, there are lots of opportunities that academia offers that perhaps other um, roles don't. I think one of the major challenges um, that especially postdoctoral researchers face is um, 
overcoming the constant fixed term contracts and moving towards um, a permanent position. I rightly or wrongly, um, we seem to be in this situation where um, there are only ever for postdocs one or two or three year positions available as a as a postdoc, and there's very very few. Um, lectureship positions or certainly very few permanent positions available and I think as institutes and as universities and as um, leaders of research larger research groups I think we need to think about how we can nurture postdoctoral researchers and how we can encourage them and how we can keep them within um, dementia related uh, research especially for not just one or two years but for a longer, much longer period of time, and, and ideally within a permanent um, position. So, for example, technical officers might be one way, one route that um, postdoctoral scientists can become permanent while still retaining, you know, some degree of uh, uh, independence in in that role. Yes, I agree fully. I mean, yeah, I suppose it's it's difficult the academic research itself when also you have to balance that with your own life you know life stages at that time when you're doing a postdoc maybe moving countries as you did um, although it's quite rewarding it can also have some challenges so yes uh, that will be good to have more initiatives towards uh, having a bit more of stability and another question is uh, looking back on your academic career what advice would you give to your younger self Ooh. Um, don't be afraid to try new things. Um, I, I think when I was growing, going through my university degree, I really had a dislike towards chemistry. I, I, I didn't get it. I didn't fully understand how chemistry worked. Um, but actually the more that I've become a, a postdoc and, and, and eventually group leader, I find that chemistry is, is arguably the most important part of my my role right without chemistry i wouldn't be able to for example attach the proteins that i work with to a glass microscope slide and so really trying to understand topics which either you you, you don't like or not familiar with or um are out with your expertise is is actually really valuable so from a professional skills point of view that is obviously advantageous but from a practical point of view in the lab um, all of these little hints and tips that you can get from different fields ultimately can be useful for your, your own research. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid to try new things. Yeah, that's a good, I suppose that's a good end message for this kind of section. Just don't be afraid to um, try new things, try new areas. You may find a different motivation than what you did before. Yeah, there's almost, almost a perception that if you're a single molecule biophysicist, you have to stay in single molecule biophysics in order to become successful. And and I would make the argument that actually, you know, switching to model membrane biochemistry or um, pursuing a new avenue in surface immobilization chemistry um, is actually even more valuable. So don't be afraid to try new things. Yes, probably maybe that's where the future is heading as well towards also integrating a new area of research so yeah well i mean that was it and um, that was the last question and i'm gonna just try to recap on all this valuable advice to see if, how my memory is doing so basically take failure or rejection as an advantage try to just move on and just the feedback that you got from that rejected paper or application to um to improve for your next application, basically. <laughs> and um, in about networking, yes, you mentioned to us, at least have a, a, a minimum quota, quite easy to meet, of meeting somebody at a conference, one poster, one talk, uh, to somebody that you can go and speak to. And most of the cases that people will be delighted of having a chat with somebody who's interested in their own things. And also, I suppose, Yes, I mean, different um, initiatives that you mentioned to try to um, make the path in academia more stable, especially at the time where where I am <laughs> at the postural um, stage. And yeah, 
as I said, try new things, try new areas so that you can find motivation to go into doing this. Hopefully that's a good recap of, of the advice that you gave us today and this is useful for our listeners. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Melissa. So we are now in the last segment of this show and before we finish, uh, we just want to talk a little bit more about mentoring and basically how helpful this mentoring scheme was, at least for me and I'm sure for many other mentees uh, who subscribe to the ARUK scheme. So, Steve, why did you decide to be a mentor? What advice will you have for anyone listening to this podcast who doesn't have a mentor yet? I think, I mean, so I was mentored um, initially and and I found it incredibly valuable um, in all, in, in various aspects of, of, of science. So from, from writing research grants to publishing papers, to um, pursuing research using undergraduate students, um, you know, dealing with uh, administration, um, dealing with finance. Um, I I managed to receive a lot of I think very useful and very helpful um, advice from from my mentors, and and so when the opportunity came up to pass on perhaps some of the the hints and tips that I received. Um, I really just jumped at the the, the chance and, and thought that this could be a good opportunity to you know to help other people and to perhaps answer questions that the other other people had that, that might be going through um, similar processes that, that I went through um, a few years ago. So I, I think yeah, because I was mentored and found it valuable, I wanted to become a mentor and I guess give give back to the to the community as well. Yeah, I mean, from my side, I can certainly say that this mentoring scheme was incredibly helpful at a really crucial career stage. So I will definitely encourage more people who are listening to us to join mentoring schemes like this one so that they are more prepared in a way to uh, face the challenges of academia and trying to stay in this path as long as possible. So, I mean, I guess the next question is, is um, for you as a mentor. So how do you go about building rapport and trust? Um, I, I think, uh, ooh, that's, 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 a, that's a good one. I, I think, I mean, it's, it's very individual about how one goes about developing rapport and, and trust, but, but ultimately at the core, building a good working relationship, I think is, 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 is key. And that means not just giving advice and telling someone what your thoughts are, but listening and listening to questions and queries that, that come up and, and really taking stock of what my mentees um, are interested in at the, the, the current time, interested in discussing at the, at the current time and, and acting upon their concerns and those those ideas again as opposed to me coming into a meeting or a a mentoring program with my own predetermined um, thoughts and ideas i think it's really important to to listen to mentees and to you know help them go through any questions that that, that they have as opposed to the other way the other way around and that in turn i think helps to build um, a good working relationship and in terms of my team um a good team uh, uh, atmosphere. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to move to the next question. So what advice would you have for someone who is about to take on their first mentor role? Ooh, sounds intimidating that way. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, listening is really, really important, right? So if you're, if you're a mentor, um, the best thing you can do, I think, is remain very quiet initially when your mentee speaks. Give them time, give them an opportunity to uh, either express concerns, ask, ask, ask questions, discuss a, discuss a topic, because your, your role is effectively to not only provide advice and, and, um, and help where, where necessary, but to listen and to encourage. And you can only do that by allowing your mentee um, 
to to speak. So I, I think listening is is probably the most important aspect of being a a, a mentor. Yes, and I was also add maybe that on the other way around when being a mentee, to me something that has really helped me to try to make the most of our mentoring sessions is to also um, have these time reserved for somebody who's going to be listening to the challenges that I'm facing and try to make the most of those words and every second of advice, you know, that I'm getting on those particular issues. So in the, on the other side, as a mentee, trying to listen to uh, advice, um, stories even, or, you know, previous experiences that my mentor may have had, has been also really helpful for me and has made me feel more reassured that, um, yeah, perhaps I'm not the only one facing the same challenges. So um, the next question is about if you could choose, ooh, anyone or alive, sorry, alive or dead to be your mentor, who would you choose? Oh, I think that's that's quite an easy one for me. Um, sadly, Professor Tom McLeish, who was a wonderful theoretician, um, a soft matter physicist, uh, passed away recently. Um, and Tom uh, is is was my next door neighbour. So we you know we would routinely bump into each other in the in the corridor, and all of the the little snippets of advice that I got from Tom were really, really valuable. And I, I always remember before Tom um, passed away, that the last time he he spoke to me, he um, was discussing how the admin staff at the University of York were so helpful in helping me create our, our annual sort of physics of life um, away day. So this is really a, an interdisciplinary one day conference where we showcase you know, emerging technologies and um, discuss new data, that, that kind of thing. And Tom always said to me that um, the admin staff are, are so, so nice and so, so friendly. And the arguably the most important trait of a scientist is that you just have to be nice to people. Um, and I always remember that from, from Tom. He, he was a genuinely gifted physicist, um, a, a great person to, to work with with he gave me fantastic advice on grant applications and um and, and papers and um you know it's, it's only when someone leaves us that i think that we fully appreciate just how valuable they they were so, so tom mcleish is is you know a, a wonderful um scientist and uh, if if tom was here today then um yeah he would be the person that that i would ask advice for from that is such a nice answer. Actually, I haven't really thought about who would be a good, good mentor for me. So yeah, I'm glad you had the opportunity at least to share some insights, knowledge, and get to know somebody who's that valuable in the academic field. And then the last question is, if you couldn't be a researcher, what would you be instead? Oh, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I... I... Yeah, I'll, I'll say it. I'll say it. I would loved to have been, I guess, growing up a, a footballer, but I was never any good. Um, so I, I, I might have been able to maybe play in the the third division of Scottish football, maybe, but um, I don't think that that was a realistic um, uh, career path um, growing up. I think if you know, if I if I hadn't have um, gone through the PhD process and 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 uh, sort of postdoc process, but still had my degree. Then I can see myself perhaps working in industry on similar things. So, for example, maybe working in the development and sales of microscopes, optical technologies, um, perhaps working um, with one of the uh, distributors of scientific equipment. I was always interested in, in science and um, technology and equipment. And so I could see myself maybe in a biomedical industry some, somewhere. But um, I'm, I'm glad that I'm in academia. Um, I think it's, it's really valuable. It's really rewarding. Um, you know, we, I think, have a rich vein of scientific discovery just around the, 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 the corner. Um, I often get excited going going into the lab. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't change where I currently am 
But maybe if I wasn't, then a really terrible footballer or uh, 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 working in working in industry somewhere. <laughs> Well, that is all we have time for today. I would like to thank my amazing mentor and guest, Dr. Stephen Queen. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Melissa. And if you would like to find out more about Stephen and his work, you will find his in my bio on the Dementia Research website. Um, the Ask Your Mentor podcast will be back soon with another mentee talking to their mentor. But for now, I'm going to finish with a joke. <laughs> A mentor of mine once told me that a great way to let go of your anger is to write letters to people you hate and then burn them. Well, I did that and I feel much, much better, but I'm not sure what to do with all these letters now. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. Thanks, Adam, for introducing that. <laughs> so, um, I'm Melissa Salazar and you have been listening to the Ask the Mentor podcast for a dementia researcher in association with Alzheimer's Research UK. Goodbye. Bye.